when I start my own company, I want there to be a community culture and I want it to be a place where people want to work. I really want to build something where people can say I came for the mission and product and company vision, but I'm staying for the community. Hello, I'm Lindsay Aiken and I manage career services at the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford University. Welcome to ms &E Stories and Voices, Graduating Student Profiles. I'm so excited today to talk with Shreya Mantha, who graduated from our bachelor's program in Windsor Quarter. She's an absolute powerhouse, and I'm convinced that in years to come, we'll be looking at her as a thought leader. Back in high school, she established a nonprofit, the Foundation for Girls, to economically empower homeless single mothers and their children through a philosophy of micro steps and tiny habits to achieve bigger and better goals. While at Stanford, she's been deeply involved with the Stanford Technology Ventures Program as the Peak Fellows Program Leader, She's a board member with the Stanford Fund, has spent time early in her Stanford career conducting AI research, and was a TA for the renowned Sleep and Dreams class. I've been so impressed with how thoughtful she is about her own goals and how she's putting in place a plan to get there. So let's start with you telling us a little bit about you, your background, and life pre-Stanford. Awesome. Thank you, Lindsay. And I'm very excited to, to be here and be in conversation with you. So a little bit about my background. I was born and brought up in Charlotte, North Carolina with my parents, my younger sister. My younger sister, Sahana, is five and a half years younger than me, but she is my, my better half in every sense. And we um, grew up as a very tight-knit family. Uh, my sister and I went to a private school, and I think we were we were very blessed to have the scaffolding and structure and support we did, but we also grew up very much in this bubble mm -hmm. of being in South Charlotte, going to a private school, having our friends close by. My parents came from India to the United States in their early 20s, and, you know, they're self-made professionals. Growing up in a household where I would, you know, sometimes come home and have certain conversations about, you know, a trip to New York or, like, going to a concert and wanting a certain pair of shoes, I think it struck my mom as, you know, my girls need to know what's beyond their small community here. Mm -hmm. It really nudged us to understand more about our community and how we could get involved and be change makers in whatever we wanted to do, mm -hmm. um, in whatever space we wanted to, to kind of change. And it was through a conversation with a woman that she had met who was on the board of a trafficking shelter. One Sunday, uh, me and my sister went. I always say we couldn't unsee what we saw. Charlotte, North Carolina is the second largest banking hub in the country, but ranks 50th out of 50th on the rank for economic mobility of the top 50 cities in the United States. Oh, wow. And so it's almost this like tale of two cities, yeah. right? It was so interesting that you had people in South Charlotte going to private schools, and then literally on the other side of town, mm -hmm. you had trafficking survivors, 14, 15, 16 years old, with children who were middle school dropouts. And that was something my sister and I couldn't not think about and um, not take action towards after seeing it. All of that kind of culminated into my sister and I saying, bottom line, we wanted to give these girls what our parents have given us, mm -hmm. and that's coaching and resources and support and community. And so Foundation for Girls, or FFG as most people call it today, started really small as a kind of family um, project of something that my sister my mom and my dad and I kind of got involved in and today it's a national organization working with young homeless and marginally housed single mothers and their children across nine states. Mm. My sister has very much taken lead on expanding virtually and now I sit on the board and kind of lead strategic vision whereas my sister is more hands-on in, in the day-to-day -day. but it'll always be my sister and, and my way of giving back. It's such fantastic and important work to do and I'm sure challenging but really rewarding at the same time too. Mm -hmm. Yeah and I think it really instilled this uh, sense of like values and principles within me and my sister being like we can do whatever we want in life but this part of our DNA that will be giving oriented will always be there and that's always kind of central into how I look at things and, and make decisions and look at opportunities which is interesting to see how the learnings of establishing and growing foundation for girls has actually led into you know my professional career even mm -hmm. through Stanford and post Stanford as well yeah talking post Stanford mm -hmm. then what is it that you're going to be doing and how are you going to be using these skills going forward I'll be joining JP Morgan uh, within their tech investment bank in San Francisco at some point I would like to be a founder operator post banking um, looking to build in fintech or health and wellness tech. Really passionate about looking at how we can combine cutting-edge tech with, with consumer-focused uh, products. And so 
hopefully I'll be able to make a product focus impact, but also one that is having societal impact as well. And then hopefully one day I can sit kind of on the investment side of things and look at how we can make the the VC world a bit more inclusive and, and provide funding to more women founders, more women founders of color. Right now, women founders of color get only 1% of venture capital. And so would love to kind of be somebody who's a part of making investments to grow that number. That would be absolutely fantastic. And so now we know where you started, Mm -hmm. where it is that you would like to go. Let's talk about that in between section, which has been your time here at Stanford and education obviously so critical you've recognized that with your foundation for girls work Mm -hmm. so what was it that drew you to Stanford in general Emerson in particular and how have these four years prepared you for this career journey that's to come for you yeah I think now sitting on the other end of it after four years and I've spent the last eight weeks having not been in class and and doing you know work and life stuff if you will Mm -hmm. really reflecting on my Stanford journey Stanford is what it is because of the people And I think you hear that in admissions tours, you hear that at Admit Weekend, but it's 100% true. I have friends who turn into family. I have friends who I see as, you know, potential investment partners in the future, Mm -hmm. potential co-founders in the future, and people who really challenge me on the day-to-day to, like, become better, to think more critically, and to do more. And I think that is really valuable. In terms of why MSNE, I really wanted something interdisciplinary. So I wanted something that really gave me the engineering skills, but I also wanted to be able to like think from different viewpoints, think from different perspectives, look at organizational theory and how that's managed. I want, wanted to understand investment science. I also wanted to dive into the statistical elements of it, the the data analytics. And I think MSNE really does give you that interdisciplinary you know, course of study. Whether I wanted to go into investment banking because I'm interested in the market and the deal flow and how deals are made and how founders have conversations, or I wanted to go on the product management side of things, or I wanted to sit on the SWE side of things, or even venture capital, I think MSNE gives you the ability to think critically about all those spaces. And then Mm -hmm. You know, it allows you to explore whatever industries you may be interested in. That is probably from a course perspective why MSNE. But I also think a lot of the people I spoke to in MSNE talked about this like MSNE mindset. And I think that was very important to me is like you think like an engineer, you kind of operate like a founder, but then you engage like a organizational leader. Mm. And I think that was something really fascinating where I knew I could operate from a very multidisciplinary perspective. I think the way of thinking is something that I'm really grateful for within the MSNE department. Awesome. So were there any particular classes that stood out to you then? I think the class that really has informed my Stanford career, which I took freshman winter, was Engineering 148-248 with Jack Fuchs. It was all about principled entrepreneurial decision making. It was very case-based. Jack had different founders come in and actually talk about internal ethical dilemmas that they face as a company, but also as a founder growing and scaling ventures. And I thought that was really interesting to hear as somebody who wants to be a founder operator at some point. But even somebody going into investment banking, I oftentimes think that people wonder what's the connection, Mm -hmm. investment banking, and then you want to be a founder operator. But I think the ability to actually sit and work on a deal with a team, but also have these nuggets in your mind about what it means for founders to make decisions, what it means for them to take capital, what it means for them to think about a merger or acquisition. It's great to have the mindset of like, oh, if I was in the founder's position or I see the founder's position Mm -hmm. versus just looking at the numbers. So I thought that was really valuable too. Yeah. It becomes about the relationships as well as just those technical skills. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of these relationships, you've had some various internships that you've done as well that have helped reinforce these skills that you've been learning in class. Mm -hmm. I've had various internships in different industries, and I never knew how they were connected, but it all makes sense in hindsight. Mm -hmm. So after freshman year, I worked with a founder, Navrina Singh. She's ex-Qualcomm, ex-Microsoft. She spent a lot of time within uh, AI, looking at kind of how AI systems are built. Then she realized that there was a need for a governance system for AI models. So very meta. Think about her building Credo AI, her company, as one that is building a system to audit AI and ML systems, Mm. um, which is really fascinating. I think amongst this growth in generative AI and the need for responsible AI, she's doing some fascinating work. And she launched the company, had to have been like March of 2020. And I had connected with her actually through a one unit AI class professor. 
AI governance in the EU. So we were connected. I spoke with Navrina and she was like, I'm launching Credo, seeing where things are going. I would welcome an intern. And so it was just me and her over the summer. And it's fascinating to see where Credo has gone today. And Navrina is a mentor that I keep near and dear to my heart. Sophomore year, it was COVID. And I was like, if there's any time to to look at banking, I am going to try banking. Um, so was at a um, another large investment bank within their tech group. Did not really enjoy the experience. I think for me, there was something about culture that was off and potentially it was part remote that, um, that made it really challenging, but just didn't have a good experience. And I was like, I am not doing finance. I'm not doing banking. It's, it's not something I want to, to venture into. I told my parents, I was like, this is not for me. But I recruited just to, you know, recruit and see uh, what would happen. So that's when I signed for with JP Morgan for my junior summer. To be honest, I never thought I I would actually go through with it. I was working on a startup called Hanger, H A N G A R, with a friend of mine who's a year older, Justin Louie, was on the men's volleyball team, and we were basically building something to reinvent the way that entrepreneurial connections are made. So you think of how the connections are made in the value. It's it's a lot through warm emails, warm introductions, Mm -hmm. and it's more of a tight-knit circle. And we were looking at how do you democratize those connections? How do you allow people to reach, you know, potential co-founders funding generative AI kind Mm -hmm. of model in the background? But what Justin and I realized through that learning journey was that there were things that we needed to learn and wanted to learn before we jumped into our next venture. Mm -hmm whether that's together as co-founders or partners or as supporters of one another. And so he decided to take the route of professional volleyball. Very, very proud of him for that. And I knew that I wanted to understand financial markets. I wanted to understand deal flow. And I wanted to sit in an institutional setting where I could really learn about how the largest companies make deals and, and have transactions go through. So I decided to, to go to JP Morgan. Had a fantastic experience. Um, I'm really looking forward to returning. But then I also, after JP Morgan was like, everyone talks about, you know, banking is sell side. What is buy side? You know, what does VC look like? Mm -hmm. And I had gotten an insight as to what early stage VC is being at Stanford, but I really wanted to understand what was growth. What is kind of the later stage venture? How do, how do you evaluate those deals? Is it just numbers? Is it still relationship building? Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to work with BAM Elevate, the investment division of Valiasny Asset Management, a very small team. We were uh, mainly fintech focused. Mm-hmm. So had the privilege of working with them fall and winter quarters of this year. Spent a lot of time understanding different uh, logistics verticals, um, mm-hmm. specifically focused on fintech and, and what financing options are. Fascinating work it has definitely informed my, again, viewpoint of, of how those decisions are made. And then spring quarter, I, I was off. I, I didn't have anything lined up. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try something completely different. So there's a company called Thrive Cosmetics. Uh, they're a beauty company. Cosmetics actually being spelled C-A-U-S-E, Medics, uh, instead of C-O-S. Founder is Carissa Bodner. She's a great mentor of my sister and I, but we connected actually through Foundation for Girls and the mm-hmm. philanthropic side of things and sat with their product marketing and you know corporate development group and got an insight into what does it mean to run a consumer brand what does it mean to run a, a beauty company a skincare company how do you understand you know product marketing consumer shopping behavior how do you structure growth and scale when you're looking at product launches and that was a really really fascinating experience so have had a, a breadth of experience and, and opportunities come my way yeah they've all informed kind of the way i think today you mentioned the culture difference in some mm-hmm. of these organizations as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that will inform you going forward too as founder operator? I think that's also one of the reasons that I was funneled to, to JP Morgan in terms of looking at banks. There was a mentor of mine who, you know, I was talking to her about different banks and opportunities and she was like, look, Trey, if you are going to work in this space, I, I know you as a person, you really care about the people you work with and you want to be around folks that invest in you. And I think JP Morgan is a great place for that. But realistically, when I start my own company, I want there to be a community culture and I want it to be a place where people want to work. I really want to build something where people can say I came for the mission and product and company vision, 
but I'm staying for the community. And that's the type of company culture that I hope to create as an entrepreneur, as a founder, as an operator. Emma Sini, you said, has given you this mindset. Mm -hmm. How have you been putting that mindset into action already? Yeah, so I think the idea of an entrepreneurial mindset has come from my work with the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and working very closely with Jack Fuchs and Tom Byers and the team over there. You know, the way that people think can be very structured and very logical, or it can be very entrepreneurial and, you know, they can have a risk-taking mindset. And I think that's what I realized is coming into Stanford, people talk about entrepreneurship. Oh, you're going to start a company. You're going to become a founder. You're going to launch a product. Yes, that is entrepreneurship, but there is a part of entrepreneurship where like tech investment bank, but why can't you have an entrepreneurial mindset when you are looking at creating a target universe and you say, this is a client, they're an enterprise SaaS client, but have you guys ever thought of looking at acquiring a company that's all about responsible AI and including that in your product suite? I think there are ways to think innovatively. I think there are ways in which you can shift people's decision-making by presenting them with new options that they would have never thought of before. And I think that is an entrepreneurial mindset. When I was actually working with Navrina Singh after my freshman year with Credo AI and, and she was building that, she was also one who said, you know, entrepreneurship is a mindset. It's about how you think about things. One of the things that she said to me early on was, try to form your own board of directors mm -hmm. that will continue to inform your mindset. And I was like, what do you mean my own board of directors? Yeah, that's really intriguing. And she goes, Think about it. A company has a board of directors, and what do they do? They make sure that they're accountable. They make sure that they're spending money wisely. They make sure that they're building the product correctly. They're building the brand correctly. Why can't you look at yourself as a company? Mm. Look at yourself as a company. Look at yourself as a brand, however you want to view that. You should have your own personal board of directors. She said it'll help you juggle everything. It'll help you get guidance and advice. Um, but really, you can surround yourself with people in an environment that'll shape and continue to shape who you are um, as you evolve. So that was really fascinating to hear is that, oh, wow, I, yeah, I am a company, a brand of my own. I think that's the entrepreneurial mindset was all about, you know, how do you go about things and think differently in different settings? But I think to have an entrepreneurial mindset, you also need to have people that really push you to think differently. Mm -hmm. I think a personal board of directors can really help you do that. Yeah, I'm really loving this whole concept. <laughs> Who is Onyos? Do they know about it? And yeah, how did you recruit them? <laughs> yeah, so for me, it's peers, it's um, professors, parents, mentors, you know, they all know they're on it. I do discuss with them, you know, you are sitting on my board of directors within the subcommittee. And I, I really do want your guidance. And I want your advice to help inform XYZ decisions. It's one of those things where you have to be open to saying, you've selected a group of people, you value their opinion, don't get offended with what they say because everyone's going to have opinions mm -hmm. and yes yeah, sometimes you're going to take it sometimes you you may not take it but you'll listen to their perspective because you've brought people on wisely because you spent time thinking carefully about kind of curating your board of directors and sometimes you you need to have those people be like i know where you're coming from mm -hmm. but i i know you and and just take a step back because yeah. you're you're so in the forest, you can't see the trees. Mm -hmm. And your personal board of directors helps you see every single tree and really find your way sometimes out of out of the forest. And so sometimes friends can be the ones that can be supportive, but sometimes they aren't always thinking critically mm -hmm. about how that is going to impact you long term. Whereas somebody, when they sit on your board of directors, they are like, this is kind of my responsibility, mm -hmm. right? Um, and if you think and choose your people wisely enough, they'll, they'll take that role seriously. Yeah. For me, like I sometimes I know people won't have their parents on their board. Both of my parents sit on my board of directors. My mom is brutally honest with me all the time, mm -hmm. personal, professional, socially. And that's something that I really value. I have something called an inner circle of trust, which Navrina told me about really early on. She goes, have different subcommittees on your board. Having 15 people on your board can get really overwhelming. But if you have an accountability subcommittee, if you have an inner circle of trust, so my inner circle of trust is my mom, my sister, my dad, I kind of group them all together. I have a peer of mine who helps co-lead Peak. I have two personal mentors and they're people who I feel like I can go to for professional decisions, personal decisions, and they kind of know me as a holistic person. Mm. Whereas there are folks where I'm like, you know me professionally, you're a professor. I've interacted with you in these situations. Yeah. Please help me think through this kind of career trajectory. Establish different subcommittees. 
whatever's important to you, and then place those people within those subcommittees. A few general questions that I ask to everyone. And so my first one is, what is your advice for people coming into the program you've just finished? Someone else might not have already told them. So I would go back to something that someone told me. I remember this so clearly. They were a senior and they were like, if there's one thing that I wish people had told me, it's to build relationships with professors mm -hmm. and do not wait to sophomore, junior, senior year, and then say, oh, I've gone through some classes with them, now I'll go up to them. They will be the guidepost throughout your Stanford career. I'm so grateful he told me that, because that's 100% true. Whether it's having professors that understand where I am academically, where I am professionally, and how that's going to inform my career, and to get their guidance and advice, it's incredibly invaluable. I'll give an example, Engineering 148-248, that I mentioned as one of my favorite classes, led by Jack Fuchs. He's a mentor for me today. I spent time conducting research with him this quarter as well. But he's somebody that I see as a mentor for years to come, and I think he'll be a lifelong mentor. He may have started off as a professor, but I see him as one that I can go to for career questions, decisions. Mm -hmm. Also the fact that he spends so much time understanding personal and company values and principles. When I start my company, I would love to have him on my actual company board of directors to really be that person that holds us accountable. Ravi Balani, Roseanne Sino, Bob Sutton, they've all been such supporters and markers in my Sanford career. So I'm just super grateful for their guidance and support throughout the four years and kind of navigating the peaks and troughs that I've, mm -hmm. I've gone through. So build relationships with professors. It can be scary and intimidating when you walk into Stanford. You know, take your first quarter or two at Stanford kind of getting your, your feet wet, but if there's a professor that interests you, if you've read a paper of, that's interesting, if you've listened to a podcast, go to their office and just chat with them. It's intimidating, but I tell you it's so worth it in the long run. And then what is your life maxim, that signature phrase of yours that you try to live by? It's just keep swimming. It's funny because Nemo was my favorite movie as a kid, and I mean, I would never watch the part in which, you know, Nemo's mom doesn't make it. My mom actually said it to me throughout high school. If one door closes, it closes for a reason, another one's going to open. If things don't seem to work out or go the way that you have intended, they actually probably have worked out. My mom has always said rejection is redirection. Every time I think of maybe things that quote unquote haven't worked out in my Stanford career, it's all worked out for a reason. Um, and in the moment it can feel really overwhelming, but the statement of just keep swimming has told me to just keep going, keep trying, keep knocking on doors. Keep moving forward, but most of all, learn, grow, and repeat. And then finally, two books and a podcast. One book that's Emerson-y mm -hmm. Emerson adjacent, another one just for fun, and then your favorite podcast. So in terms of books, I'll mention two. So one is actually a book that my friend Justin gave me recently, right before he left to play for Team Canada. It's one-on-one -on -one essays that will change the way you think. And the author, Brianna Weiss, it's, I mean, she's gained renowned kind of acknowledgement for her moving in philosophical writing. The goal of the book is to, in a very short snippet, a paragraph or two, push you to think differently. Um, think about maybe cognitive biases that are creating the, the way you see life. You know, see the wisdom in your daily routine or daily habits. Actually embrace negative thinking sometimes. Each one will really push you to think differently, analyze your way of seeing things, and really makes me see certain opportunities or experiences with a different perspective and through a new lens. So that's one that I think everyone should just keep by their bedside and, and read one before bed or when they wake up. The other one is the 1% rule. So it's how to fall in love with the process and achieve your wildest dreams. The author Tommy Baker is sharing in a nutshell, really how to fall in love with the process of things. In short, enjoy the journey. Don't be hyper fixated on the destination. The podcast that I just love is On Purpose with Jay Shetty. Jay Shetty's purpose is to make wisdom go viral. And so his On Purpose podcast brings together fascinating conversations with insightful people across industries and sectors. Sometimes when you think of insightful people, you think of thought leaders, mm -hmm. but he, he feels that every single person has wisdom, whether that's Kobe Bryant, whether that's Alicia Keys, Ariana Huffington, Giselle, like Ray Dalio. Mm -hmm. He'll bring these people in conversation and really just unpack certain life stories or dilemmas they've been through and see how they've made those decisions. And gosh, if I can ever meet him, I would be totally starstruck. I think he's an incredible <laughs> podcaster, author, entrepreneur. So if Jay Shetty were to ever listen to this podcast, please know I'm, <laughs> I'm your base fan. But the other thing that I would actually include, I know you've asked for, for two books in one podcast, is actually the ETL podcast by mm -hmm. STVP. I listened to ETL before I came to Stanford. 
Um, I used to listen to them on like my morning runs or like evening walks. And I think the the snippets, the tidbits that you hear, you can always learn from someone else's journey. I, I love the way that ETL kind of conducts those conversations. And at the end of the day, when are you ever going to have the opportunity to hear from hundreds and hundreds of incredibly insightful, thoughtful world leaders and, and change makers and entrepreneurs? Thank you for joining us for this episode of MSNE Stories and Voices, Graduating Student Profiles. This episode was produced and edited by me, Lindsay Aiken, with editing help from Jim Fabry. Our music was composed and performed by Catherine Barron, another student in our master's program. Please be sure to subscribe to us on Spotify or whichever platform you're listening through. And check out our website at msne.stanford.edu. It's msande.stanford.edu. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.